Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together. Welcome you to the house of the Lord. We are expecting great things. Anybody expecting great things this morning? Amen. 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 Let's look to the Lord in prayer. So, God, we just open our hearts. We lift up our hands to you. And we just say, welcome, Holy Spirit. We thank you for this harvest season. Thank you for this beautiful weather. And, Lord, we just celebrate who you are. We celebrate what you have done in our lives. And we give you the honor and the glory and the praise. May our hearts be open to worship. May our hearts be open to receive your word. Have your will and have your way. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen Amen. and amen. Amen. Worship team, bless you as you lead us this morning. Let's enter in. Amen. Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful Sunday we have today. The Lord has given us a beautiful day yet again.
with mercy for today faithful you have been and faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and that's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my everyone. Yes, you may be seated. <laughs> I just have a couple of announcements this morning. Um, Thursday is volleyball as usual, thanks to Erica and her wonderful leadership. I'm sure I'm having a blast. <laughs> She's lots of fun. Um, so if you know of neighbors with kids or young adults or even adults, we have all ages, I think, and uh, just invite them to come. They're at the public school and everyone's invited. Pre-service prayer from 10 o'clock on is going to be in the sanctuary in the mornings, and we invite you to come. It's a lovely time of just joining our hearts together and enjoying one another's company, and especially the presence of the Lord. So please consider that. 
and your tithes and offerings. This morning, the offering box is at the back. We have a debit machine as well, and if you need help with that, just ask one of the ushers and hosts. Um, and, you know, it, it struck me with all of the bounty that we have here and the, thinking about the season, um, how thankful we are that we can give back to the Lord a portion of what he asks for, but also that it's our privilege to give it and to uh, expect the blessing that he promised. You know, it's not because of the blessing, but it's because of our hearts overflowing with gratitude for what he has done for us. So. Um, we just bless you as you give, and we can continue the work here in Millbrook. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we glorify and magnify your name this morning, how awesome your presence is. God. Oh, God. Fill us up, oh, Lord. We bless the tithes and offerings this morning, Lord Jesus, but most of all, it's you. It's our privilege to serve you in the vineyard here in Millbrook and uh, beyond as our offerings go out into so many areas. Thank you for each one in this place and ask you to uh, touch their lives today in a very special way. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 I invite you all to stand once again. We're going to worship him in his great name.
Church. Hallelujah. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Oh, just declare. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Better than you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just with our heads bowed for just a moment, just before we leave our worship time. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, the situation that I'm in, I need God to be greater than that situation. You understand that what you're going through, that you need a miracle. Amen. <laughs> and he's the only one that can bring a change, can bring a shift. Their heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And you're here and you're that person. Can I just see your hand? You say, yeah, I need God to answer prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Just sing that once again. Just sing that whole chorus. Okay. And I want us together to lift up our hands and just intercede for those who have this need. He turns our graves around. He, he, he called Lazarus out of the grave and he can call your situation differently and bring it forward. Let's sing it to the Lord and let's intercede. Will you lift your hands and just say, God, you're able. You're able. Oh, there's nothing. Just speak to that situation. Better than you, Lord, oh, there's, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. dancing there's the change yes you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens yes you turn bones into armies you turn seeds into highways you're the only one who can you're the only one who can oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Just Jesus. take the hand of the person Thank next you, to you. Let's agree together. So, God, you change situations. Thank you. Thank you that you are a God of change. And I pray for everyone that stands in need of a miracle. You turn the grave into a garden. That's what you do. Amen. So we are believing for those who have this deep need this morning. Yes, you are Jesus. a God who hears and answers prayer. Yes, we declare Jesus. the word. We speak faith. We yes, call those Lord. things which be not as though they are. Hallelujah. And we are agreeing together for miracles Hallelujah. in this house. Hallelujah. You are still the God of miracles. You're the same Amen. yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. I pray for strength. I pray for sustenance. Thank you, May Jesus. we see ourselves on the potter's wheel today as has been Thank spoken. You, May we understand we're under the blood. The blood is not congealed. It's flowing, and it's for us today. So we declare that you're the God of the, of the, of the suddenly. You're the God of the miracle. You are the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, Lord, speak. Speak to these situations. Give us these miracles. And we will believe you. Thank you and we await the testimony of answered prayer. And we'll thank Amen. you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Just remain standing and take your Bibles in Judges chapter 6. Just as we honor the word, Judges chapter 6. Thank you so much, worship team. Amazing, amazing again. Bless you. Thank you. Judges chapter 6. We have been doing a four-part series on how to have intimacy with God. And today is the final one, the principle of perception, the study of Gideon. And uh, Judges chapter 6, as we read together. And again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites because the power of Midian was so oppressive. The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country, they camped on the land. They ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. And it was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravish it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian... He sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came, sat down under the oak in Oprah, that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites as, they were, as if they were but one man. Gideon replied, if now I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me, please. Do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. May God bless the reading of his word. Before you're seated, turn to the person next to you, look them in the eye and say, I love you more than pumpkin pie. 
Then you may be seated. I think most of the children have left, so they can be dismissed if they're still here. The principle of perception. Even though you are presented with evidence that something is true, you won't believe it unless you feel that it is true. And from that, we can say, to bring about change, we have to have an emotional connection with truth. The perception we have of ourselves, again, as we have been teaching, is influenced by our family of origin, our culture, and our generation. And your identity is found in whatever you give your heart to. And so what we have been talking about is that we have all grown up and what has influenced us is parents, culture, and generations. And so I was filling my car up with, a few years back, with antifreeze in the windshield container and I'm pouring it in, and it's spilling. And I told you I have come from a Scotch, Scottish culture. Scotch is what you drink, my wife tells me, so I have to say <laughs> Scottish. I come from a Scottish culture, and I heard a voice. It said, where is the funnel? Scotsmen always use a funnel because they don't want to waste anything. So we have a culture. My wife and I were driving in enjoying the, the, uh, the trees and all the harvest season and we have the worship on and my wife commented that she could hear her mother say as they, because they would all harmonize and they were all very musical and if one of them would get off tune, then she said this morning she could hear her, her mother say, pick a note. <laughs> and so there are things that influence us, good, bad, and ugly. And when we grow up with parents, culture, and generations, what happens is, over time, we develop our own culture. And what, what God wants to do, he not only, watch this, he not only wants to save us, but he wants to sanctify us. And we had the diagram of the, the two rivers that God wants us to cross, and many of us have crossed uh, the Red Sea, but we haven't crossed the Jordan. When we get across the Red Sea, we find ourselves in salvation, but when we cross the second river, we find ourselves in sanctification. How many know that we're on a journey with God and that every day he wants us to move forward and become like him? And what he wants us to do is he wants us to embrace the good things from parents, culture, and generations, but anything that's contrary to the fruit of the Spirit, he wants us to set aside and become more like him. What says he wants us to trade our, uh, our own culture for a kingdom culture. Jesus came not only to save us, but to bring a kingdom. And guess what? He is the king. The thing about being in a kingdom, it's different than a democracy. There's only one person gets to vote, and that's the king. My problem is I like to vote. Right? But God wants us to give our heart to him so that we are all in, we're abandoned, and anything that is contrary to Scripture, to Holy Spirit, 
to the fruit of the Spirit, he wants us to set aside and embrace kingdom culture. So what we've been talking about for these four weeks is trade in your soul culture for spirit culture, spend time in prayer and in the word, become more like him, and and embrace the kingdom of God. That's why he came. And so we've been talking about the principle of position with Abraham. It's not what you say, it's where you're standing when you say it. We've talked about uh, the principle of passion. And we've got to find ourselves having passion if we're going to have intimacy with God. That was talking about Moses. We talked about the principle of perseverance, that we often can't do this ourselves. We need somebody else in our life discipling us, a Barnabas, a a, a Ruth, somebody that will walk beside us. That's the, the principle of perseverance. It's really hard to push through some walls that parents, culture, and generations have established, but often if somebody is a half a step ahead of us, they can pull us forward. And that's why Jesus said, go and make disciples. If you want to have a vision for the coming months in the coming year, go and make disciples. Every one of us should have a Timothy. Every one of us should have a Naomi. We should be pouring into somebody because of what God is doing in our life. And so that's a little Reader's Digest of what we've been talking about for these past three Sundays. And so the, the principle of position, of passion, of perseverance... And today, the principle of perception. So let's look at our study. Here we find Gideon at the back of the cave. And I think that of the four teachings, this is my, one of my favorites. It's so cool. And so Gideon... Gideon is at the back of the cave. He's hiding from the enemy. He's facing the wall. And some of us may feel that way. And the question is, how do I get out of the cave? Can I suggest that, and this may seem simple, but stay with me. If you're going to get out of the cave, you've got to turn around. Like there's something that has to change. And this is what I want you to see for a moment. God not only wants us to turn with our head and see where we're supposed to go, but he also wants us to turn with our heart. You see, when you just turn with your head, then that is remorse. You're feeling bad about your situation. But when you turn with your heart, that's repentance. Repentance is not a bad thing. Repentance is when we recognize we're doing something wrong and your, your wife is telling you you're doing something wrong. You've been doing it for years. God wants you to change as well as your wife. And the only way we can change is through repentance. So our first point today is that we must turn around. If we're at the back of the cave, because of doubt and fear and worry and unforgiveness, it's often because we believe a lie. Somebody has spoken something that went right into your spirit, and you believed it. When, if we are going to have intimacy with God we are going to have to understand who we are. We shared a message with you about a, a false self. A false self is someone who it's, it's not what you have, it's not what you do, and it's not what people think of you. You've got to know who you are in God. If you're going to fight the enemy, if you're going to have intimacy with God, if you're going to persevere, you're going to have, the, have to have the proper perception of who you are. And so here was Gideon hiding at the back of the cave and his father was one of the Israelites. He was one of the leaders and one of the Israelites 
because of sin, gave the enemy a legal right to beat them up. So he's hiding. And we cannot hear the voice of God because our spirit is buried by our soul. And the head often turns, but the heart doesn't. And God, as we've talked about, God wants your heart. You have to identify where your treasure is. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When you find your treasure, you find your heart. And Jesus Christ gave his life for you and I so that we would love him. And when you study 1 John, if you love him, you will obey him. And so when you give your heart to the Father, that's what he desires, because that's where the change comes. God can do a miracle in your life, and you can discover uh, an intimacy with Father God that is just amazing. And so you've got to turn around not only with your head, but you've got to turn around with your heart. And so when you give your heart to the Father, be ready for him to identify some things that he desires. Because he wants you to be successful. He wants you to be blessed. He wants to pour out of his spirit on you. He wants to bring change. Now, if you're staying in the desert, you're going to have some challenges. But I'm telling you, when you turn around and give your heart 100% to God and you let him change you, that's where Christian life becomes exciting. This isn't about religion. This is about relationship. And if we're going to be Pentecostal people, we've got to stop being religious and start having relationship. We've got to let God into our life and take control. We've got to embrace Holy Spirit. We've got to preach the whole counsel of God. We've got to embrace what God says, and we say yes to him. And it begins with a repentant heart. Say, Lord, help me to change. Help me to become like you. Help me to have that impartation of love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and meekness and faith and long-suffering and self-control. Repentance is change. And so if we're at the back of the cave and we're discovering that, that there are so many challenges and we're drawing on our mind, will, and emotion, but we're not drawing on our spirit, Say yes to the Lord. I want to turn around. I want to establish a new journey and a new direction. So these points are going to be brought to you by the letter R. That'll help you remember them. So first of all is repentance. The second one is resources. And so our message very simply today is you have what it takes. You see, when you, when you go on this journey with God, the enemy is going to start talking to you that you are incapable. Oh, and here's one of the ones he really likes to use. You're unworthy. Anybody have heard that? You're unworthy. I'm here to tell you, when Jesus Christ comes into your life, old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. Not only do we need to forgive others, but sometimes we have to forgive ourselves and know that our name is written down in the Lamb's book of life, and we need to take hold of our identity and who we are. You have what it takes to go on this journey of intimacy with God. Look with me at Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. And I was reading this one day, and it said, take with, with you seven of every kind of clean animal, male and his mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. And I read that, and I thought, okay, when I was at Sunday school, all they told me was they went in two by two. Now I'm reading seven. And it, 
it kind of threw me for a moment. And I kept reading. So when we keep reading, this is what we find. And also, seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. To get the answer to this, go with me to the next chapter, Genesis 8, beginning at verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, that's of the seven, he sacrificed <coughs> excuse me, burnt offerings on it, and the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. And so when we find ourselves looking at this study, God has put into the ark and into you what is necessary for life, multiplication, and sacrifice. So two by two, that was for the multiplication. The seven were for sacrifice. And God has put in you what you need for life, multiplication, and sacrifice. Stay with me. Romans 12, 1 and, 10, 1 and 2. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. I, I'm not trying to sell you... Uh, a, a bag of goods here. I'm, I'm here to tell you to go on this journey of intimacy with God. There's a cost involved. It's going to take some perseverance. It's going to take some choice. It's going to take uh, saying, I, I don't want to just be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Don't go quiet on me. And sometimes there has to be a sacrifice and a choice. That's been my experience. And God, when he put it in the ark, he, he put in life, multiplication, sacrifice, and he's put inside of you the ability to go on this journey. And when you look back at parents, culture, and generations, you maybe never had a level of intimacy with your earthly father or earthly mother. But I'm here to tell you, God stands uh, just, like, just like the father stood waiting for his uh, repentant son to come home. He was, he was standing on the edge of the property looking. God is jealous for your sonship, and he's saying to you, you are capable of going on this journey. And sometimes the enemy will tell us, if I turn around, if I choose to go on this journey, I don't have what it takes to get out. Sometimes it's a long walk from there to the entrance. But God says, I put within you what you need. And so we keep our face to the wall. And God has given us that ability to be strong and have intimacy with him. I want you to look with me at your Bibles and look at our text, Judges 6. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Let me go back, let me go back to verse 7. Let's start there. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of <coughs> slavery, <coughs> Excuse me, I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. 
I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but now you've listened to me. Let me stop here. There are those people in the body of Christ who will remind you of your past and remind you of your failures. Anybody know? I won't ask for a show of hands. There are those that want to make us feel small. I want you to know that's not the heart of God. I want you to notice this. So when we carry on here, so the prophet reminded him of the past and reminded him of his failures. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Oprah and belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I, I... I'm thankful that for people who remind me what God has done yesterday. But there are times I need somebody that comes with a word and has a prophetic voice and lets me know that it's going to be okay. I need somebody that will walk with me that will say, you can do this. And I'm here to tell you, we need to shift this principle of perception of who we are. And, and we need to understand, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, my God will raise up a standard against him. Come on, people. It's time to understand who we belong to. Our names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Stop talking to me about my failures. Let me know that it's going to be okay. Here's Gideon hiding from the enemy. The angel of the Lord comes and calls him a mighty warrior. And I can see Gideon. He's called a mighty warrior by the angel of the Lord. And he goes, that's my word for you today. You are a mighty warrior. That's who God sees you. I don't care your age, whether it's young or old. I'm here to tell you, you've got to get the right perception of who you are. Again, your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. There's a legal document that says you belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Make sure as a son or a daughter that you're influenced from the inside out, not the outside in. There's a voice, and it comes from the very throne room of God and says, you are a mighty warrior, and you have what it takes. Now, if you want to stay married to your soul and married to your failures and married to parents, culture, and generations, and and just let your soul dictate your uh, your life, uh, then, then, then that's fine. But if you want some freshness, if you want a fresh vision, if you want a fresh anointing, if you want the fullness of God, stop worrying about just crossing the first river, set your sights and cross the second river and step into a second river anointing, a second river prosperity, a second river language. Some of us are so depressed and discouraged, nobody wants to be with us. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and say, I belong to Jesus Christ. We are to be people of the Spirit. Pentecostal people, the people that have the most fun. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And I'm preaching these messages for my wife and I out of our own personal journeys of where God's brought us. And our passion is to help others understand. It's not just about being born again, no matter how beautiful that is, but it's walking with God every day. It's becoming, it's becoming more like him. That's where the joy is. That's where the experience is. That's where the relationship is. 
So repentance, you turn around. Resources, you have what it takes. I love this next point, restructure. Turn with me to <coughs> First Chronicles. First Chronicles 15, verse 13. So the story here is that Yuza and Ohio were walking with the ark. The oxen stumbled and Yuza put his hand on the ark and he was killed. The ark was the presence of the Lord. And David was distraught and he was angry with God. Because one of his men were killed. And when we pick up our story... In 1 Chronicles 15, there was a restructuring that was going on. 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 13. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of, the, ark of God with the poles on their shoulders. Watch. As Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. Folks, hear me. If you're going to have intimacy with God, it's going to be according to to the Bible. We cannot apologize for the word. We got we to gotta preach the word. We got to live by the word. And when you read the word, get ready for Holy Spirit to bring something off the page that becomes real to you. You see, the Logos is a general word of God. So we're reading the Logos. But there's also the word rhema. That's the original, or that is the word of God that comes off the page to you. That is a specific word for a specific person at a specific time. How many have ever experienced rhema where God has spoken to you and given you a word? And, and when you study faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that's the word rhema. When you get a rhema word, faith comes alive. And we wonder where faith is. Well, you got to spend time reading the word. You got to be into the Logos. And when you're reading the Logos, get ready for the Rhema to come off the page. And so here is David trying to figure out why God would slay one of his men. And when his emotions settled down, he started to talk to God. And God says, Well, there's a prescribed way. Now, that's why we have devotions to figure out what the prescribed way is. Now, we have our way. It's the way we saw our parents and culture and generations, you know. That's the way they always did it. But maybe God wants to take you on a different path. And so God, so David's all excited. He finally figured out there is a prescribed way to carry the presence of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, when you get into intimacy with God, you start carrying his presence and you understand the fear of God and you start carrying it in a prescribed way because you want to please the Father. 
We got preachers that come to the pulpit and they've got a soulish message and they haven't spent time in the Holy of Holies and they kind of give you what they found on the internet and it's not fresh and it's not new. We need spiritual leaders who know the Holy Ghost and know the Word and spend time with Him so that there's a fresh Word. There's got to be a rhema Word for the preacher if there's going to be a rhema Word for the congregation. Come on, church. It's time to get ready. The trumpet's about to sound. The dead in Christ are going to be risen up. And we've got to have the the oil in our lamps, and it's got to be trimmed and shining brightly. There's a preparation that we need to have in order to get ready for Jesus to come. It's time to get in the Holy of Holies. Not trying to accomplish something in our flesh. I wouldn't give you a wooden nickel to come to church and listen to somebody that got a sermon off the internet. I want to know you've been spending time with God. I want a fr- I need a fresh, what I've been through this week, I need a fresh word to help me get through another week. The challenges that I face. So David comes, he comes to the men that he wants to carry the presence of the Lord. He comes to the Levites. And he says, I want to bring up the ark. And I want you to carry the ark. And again, they're looking at David. And they're saying, us? Do you know what happened to the last person that tried to carry the presence of the Lord? David said, I got it figured out. It's time we get this thing figured out. There's a prescribed way. And it's described here. And it says that you've got to, I love this. He said, it was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. When you're facing decisions, inquire of the Lord. When you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're trying to figure things out, ask God until he speaks to you and you know of what you're supposed to, to do. So you went in because of the fear of man, but you must come out in the fear of God. <laughs> so... The fear of man puts you in, and it's the fear of God who brings you out. The fear of God is to give him your undivided heart. And so David restructured the ark, and we must do the same. So the Levites must carry the ark on poles. And that's what it is for us to walk in the Spirit. When Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, he said it for you and I as well. And here I want to come back to one of our texts today. where it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Time's almost gone, but I (coughs) want you to see this. The Bible says that the Levites got ready to carry the ark, and I can just see them. The Bible says they took a few steps and then they made sacrifices to the Lord. What that shows me is humility toward God. You're never going to be in intimacy with God until you set aside your pride and come in humility and brokenness. That's why the Bible says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Do you know sons and daughters are excited about sacrifice? Servants say, you want me to do what? Sons and daughters say, I want to please the Father. So if you're struggling with what God's asking you to do, (coughs) ask him to shift your heart. Put a yes in your spirit and say, I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is my reasonable service. 
I love this next point. So we're at repentance and resources and restructure, and now we come to resolve. Watch this. What puts you into the cave will be waiting for you when you come out. Sometimes we think when we turn around and repent and we start walking out, everything's going to be okay. <coughs> but how many, have, <coughs> excuse me, how many have found in your journey with God that the enemy still comes and still says and does his thing? And that's where you need resolve. If you have repented and you know your source and you've restructured yourself, all you need now is resolve. Someone said, the dream is free, but perseverance is sold separately. <laughs> Some people have a dream and they say, oh, I, I, I want to know God. So they have this dream. The dream is free, perseverance is sold separately. My wife and I have been on quite a journey. How many years? 56? I've said before, my wife knows all the verses of amazing grace. But this morning, I just was reflecting on all that we've been through and the blessings of God today and where we are Honey, thank you for being there and staying by my side. This is not always an easy journey. It takes resolve. And we are here today enjoying the blessing and favor of God because as a couple, we were committed to each other and we were committed to serving God. Amen. Don't ever give up. Whatever you're going through right now, find somebody. If you're not married, find somebody to walk with. There's power in agreement. And when you look at this, the Bible says to put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6. John 15 says, you don't have to produce the fruit. You need to learn how to abide. And I thank God for my wife today. She's learned how to abide. And we've we push through and we're able to help others. You know, one of the reasons you go through stuff is so that you can turn around and help somebody else. So don't discount what you've been through. There's such value. And don't forget everybody that you're in relationship has some gold in them. Just take someone like yourself to find it and to bring it out. Repentance, resources, restructure, resolve, and finally renew. The lie forced you in, but it will be the truth that will pull you out. You shall know the truth, <clears throat> and the truth will set you free. Stop believing the lie that you are insignificant and incapable, and you cannot do this. And know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's the truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the truth that God calls you to. Truth and trust are intertwined. God called Gideon a mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Go in the strength that you have. Gideon quickly said, <clears throat> I've got, I'm the weakest clan. I'm the weakest of my clan. Hmm. God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you give your heart to God, he will take and he'll make strength and bring you into success. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. The uh, Roman says, <clears throat> excuse me, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We can help people who say, I can't, but we can't help people who say, I won't. And God wants us to help one another. And so I want to leave you with this thought. 
Look with me at Judges chapter 6 in verse 24. So we've been sharing with you about the second river. And that's what God showed me in the year 2000. I'd crossed the first river, but I hadn't crossed the second. And I crossed the second when I began adding obedience to my faith, which is sanctification. That I'd spent 30 years of ministry in the outer court, and God wanted me to get into the Holy of Holies. And so that's been the journey of our lives these years. And so what I want you to see here in Judges 6 and 24, it says, And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. And to this day it stands in Oprah of the Abiezrites. Time does not permit, but Gideon went through all of this where he, uh, he, he put a sacrifice on a rock. And, and, and he said, now, if, if you're really God, you'll come and consume this. And on, on he went through this testing and dealing with his own lack of faith. And then the Bible says that the light came on and Gideon realized that he was talking to the angel of the Lord. And when he did that, he built an altar. Again, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1 and 2. But then I want you to notice, that same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So I talked to you about the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Now I want to conclude with the second altar. Stay with me here. So the first altar, Gideon realized this this was real. God was speaking to him. The presence of God. And God was calling him to lead the Israelites out of bondage. But then God said, I want you to build a second altar. Remember, first river, second river, first altar, second altar. This is what I want you to see. His father was a part of the leadership that sinned and gave the enemy a legal right to come and occupy what belonged to God. And so before Gideon could be the leader of the Israelites and walk as his son and become a spiritual father, watch this, he had to cut the soul tie with his earthly father. You with me? What God's made so real to me is that I had a great father but I allowed him to set the paradigm rather than Father God. I stepped into a Norcross culture rather than a kingdom culture. And so there comes a point, if you want to have the depth of intimacy with God, you've got to cut all the soul ties. Not that you break relationship, or I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about, watch this, I'm talking about allowing Father God to reparent you to become like him. So I, I, if, you're going to, if you're going to lead the Israelites and I'm going to be with you and you're going to defeat the Amalekites, you've got to be all in. There can't be any, there can't be any soul tie. There can't be, I uh, wonder what dad thinks. No, no, it's not what dad thinks. It's what God thinks. we could catch this, some things would change. Just, that's what it is to walk in the spirit. Watch what it says. This is so cool. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, cut it down 
and the Asher pole beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of the bluff, using the wood of the Asher pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants, and he did as the Lord told him, but because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than the daytime. If you're going to do it, do it afraid, but do it. And I'm not talking about cutting off relationship with family. What I'm talking about is there were so many wonderful things that my father and my mother taught me, and I thank God, both Carol and I thank God for our heritage, but anything that's contrary, that's what I'm talking about, anything that's contrary to the fruit of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come. Let the sanctification cleanse me so I can become like you. There's a second river, and there's a second altar. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. Will you stand with me together? The word is so exciting. Bow your heads with me if you would. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just been a beautiful sense of his presence. We've just been praying this week that Holy Spirit would visit us. Because without the Holy Spirit, we're just another club, another organization. We need his presence. So heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Our message today is the principle of perception. How do I see myself? It's really about letting Father God reparent us. It was very difficult for myself. I love my dad, but I realized I had to push past and find God for myself. As we close this series of messages, as we consider carrying the presence of the Lord in the prescribed way, in a moment I'm going to ask you to respond. I believe this message requires a response. You're here today and there are some things that you would say, yeah, there's some things contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. And I, I want to I wanna push through that. I want to pray for you in this closing prayer. God wants you to be successful. He wants you to be his masterpiece. Hebrews says he's the father of our spirit. So when we spend time feeding our spirit, he reparents us. You just sense Holy Spirit speaking to you. Can I just see your hand? You'd say, Pastor, pray for me in this closing prayer. Oh, all across this place. Just go ahead. Thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. God bless you. Yes, thank you. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. God, this is our hour to get ready for your return. Help us to carry the impartation of Holy Spirit so that people around us will know and understand who we belong to and that you are reparenting us to become more like you. You're such a great God. and You want us to be your masterpiece. For those hands that have been raised this morning, speak Holy Spirit. Have your will and have your way. And allow us to take any idols and, 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 and present them on the altar to you. For you've called us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. May our devotions tomorrow go deeper and go stronger. May we... Embrace the word 
have your will and have your way, and we'll thank you. And all God's people said, amen. 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 And amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Shall we do that? Thank you, Lord. Worship team as a final song. God bless you. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. Say